for it. This week's or this month's topic is the wonder of trees and promise of taking root by uh, Gail frickin' Clark, who is a current member of uh, Miami Group Political Committee and has been for several years. She was recruited by Debbie Clark, a master gardener from Wyoming, and was surprised and happy to find so many of her friends already members of the Miami Group Sierra Club. Uh, <clears throat> I won't read uh, all of this, but uh, significantly in here, she's gotten involved in this uh, program, Taking Root, and is going to be telling us uh, all about that, and we uh, certainly appreciate it. So, uh, without further ado, I'll uh, have uh, I'll stop sharing, and Gail can start sharing, and off we go. Thank you. Okay, everybody, let's see if I can do this without messing things up. Come on, share screen. That's not what I want. I want my screen. Can you see the wonder of trees and the promise of taking root? Am I sharing it? Not yet. Anybody? Yeah. Not yet? Okay. Yeah, share screen is the uh, is the thing you need to do. You can either share your whole computer or pick a particular screen to share. Okay, I hit the share screen, but what came up was the Miami group. Hmm. Uh, so you Hang on, and I, my camera's there, and here it is. Okay, share. Perfect. Right. I think it's loading now. now. Going. I just had to, I just had to poke things at the right time. Okay, now you can see the wonder of trees and the promise of taking root. Everybody, yay! Thank you, Karen, <laughs> and thank you all for inviting me here tonight. I'm going to be reading my text here, so don't, don't, uh, uh. Look at the screen, not at my not at my icon. Um, I really am happy to talk about trees. They're my favorite subject. I am kind of a tree hugger, and I'm I'm glad to share this with all of you guys because I know that you'll be interested, and hopefully you will be interested enough to take some action. Um, taking root and my committee, the Trees Make a Difference group, um, are really trying to be active in the area about getting trees planted. Um, I've grown up with trees um, and, and until recently, I believe we all took trees for granted. I did, but the changes in our environment, with the changes in our environment, we need to pay more attention to trees and value them more. I served many years on the Wyoming Urban Forestry Board and I learned about trees from the people I served with and from the courses I took at the Boone County UK Extension offices and from our Southern Ohio State Forester, Wendy Van Buren. I don't know if you know Wendy, but she's a wonderful resource in our area for trees. And I think Southwest, the Southwest area that Wendy manages for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources is also roughly the same area that Miami Group covers. So if you're in Miami group, probably Wendy's the person to call. What I found out from all these people is now that we can no longer ignore trees as part of the background of our lives. I want to share a few of the amazing things that I've learned about trees in the past few years. And then I want to talk about how trees are endangered and what we can do about it. First of all, trees live in communities. They grow best and are healthiest when they are in groups and are connected by their roots and natural healthy soil fungi called mycorrhizae. I can remember some years ago, mycorrhizae were sold as planting aids. They seem to make plants grow better, but nobody seemed to understand why. Suzanne Simard, a forest ecologist, doing research in the Pacific Northwest, made a major discovery that this symbiosis between tree and fungus enables the purposeful sharing of resources, helping the whole system of trees and plants to flourish. The fungi actually move carbon, water, and nutrients between trees depending on their needs. 
the big trees were subsidizing the young ones through the fungal networks. And without a hemping hand, most of the seedlings wouldn't milk it, make it. At the hub of the forest mycorrhizal network stands the mother tree. These are large, older trees that man, may manage the resources of the whole plant community. Dr. Simard's research reveals that when a mother tree is cut down, the survival rate of the younger members of the forest is substantially reduced. For us, that means that when we plant, we need to plant in groups. No one can have a group of oaks or maples in their suburban yard, but we can plant an oak and then a few dogwoods around that and a few other understory shrubs mixed in. No single maples or sweet gum standing alone in the yard anymore. Groups of plants are healthiest. Second, based on research of talk, Dr. Tom Kimmerer at the University of Kentucky, for all intents and purposes, trees are biologically immortal. While it's not precisely known whether or not individual trees are immortal in the same fashion, their cells do not age and they definitely don't grow old in the same way that animals do. Trees actually grow faster as they age. <clears throat> Much of the living cells of trees are the plant equivalent of stem cells allowing trees to heal any injury over time. The primary reason trees die is not because they get old. It's from outside forces in the environment, pests, diseases, fire, and of course, human intervention. The world's largest and possibly oldest living organism is Pando. It's a quaking aspen clone in Utah where all the trees arise from the same root system. While the exact dating is not possible, this clone could be 80,000 years old. This clone occupies 107 acres and it is one single organism. Another example of long-lived trees is local. On the drive down I-75 to Lexington, other historic trees can be seen. Large hardwoods standing alone in pastures and fields. Dr. Kimmerer calls them sentinel trees. When Europeans first arrived in what is now the bluegrass area, they were amazed that there were great areas without trees. Miraculous, they said. We don't have to cut down trees to farm here. Dr. Kimmerer did some research on how these huge solitary hardwood trees remain in the landscape. They are remnants from a time when buffalo were common and migrated through the bluegrass area. When huge herds were here, they churned up the landscape with their hooves. Small trees seeds and anything else that was eaten what or anything else was eaten or destroyed during the migration in the years between migrations some trees grew large enough to stand above the churning and remained alone because they could put deep roots down into the limestone for water and because just on the happenstance they grew enough between migrations to stand above to stand above the, uh, the buffalo when they arrived. These are sentinels from pre-European America and are hundreds of years old. Unfortunate, whoops, sorry. Unfortunately, the urban sprawl of Lexington is taking these trees one by one. There is only one similar place in the United States, and that's the limestone plateau around Nashville, Tennessee, where other sentinel trees exist. However, the urban sprawl from Nashville is also taking these trees from us. 
A third important thing that trees do is they have an effect on human physical and emotional health. The, they provide measurable physiologic effects, not just the psychological enjoyment of the beauty of a forest. In the 1980s, the Japanese documented the benefits of being among trees. They call it Shinrin Yoku, forest bathing. The sounds of the forest, the scent of the trees, and the sunlight eases our stress and worry and help us relax and think more clearly. Phytoncides, aromatic compounds generated and released by trees, lower heart rate and blood pressure, reduce stress hormone production, and boost the immune system. And these effects can last a month after one session of forest bathing. This is not exercise, not hiking or jogging. It is simply being in nature, connecting with it through our senses of sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch, and breathing in those phytoncides. The best part about Shinrin Yoku is it's free, available to anyone who can get out into the woods. Trees are good is the motto of the International Society of Arboriculture. This is a professional international organization that tracks, tests, and certifies arborists at the height of their profession. So they know what they're talking about. So fourth, trees benefit our environment. Each tree we plant adds something of value and the longer they live, the more value they add. Trees cool with the evaporation of water from the leaves. The leaves catch and hold storm water, and the roots, of, roots absorb more storm water from the soil. With the tremendous storms that climate change has brought, there is more need for storm water mitigation trees by trees, more need for stormwater mitigation of trees. Trees metabolize carbon dioxide and release oxygen. And the carbon ends up in the wood, the lignin of the tree. One car produces four and a half tons of carbon every year. So you can see how we need trees to capture the carbon from cars and from anything that uses fossil fuel. This is from a tree benefit calculator available on the ISA website. The ISA website is treesaregood.org. Here you can see the benefits in very specific form. You can search by zip code, by tree, and by tree size, and the calculations will come out how beneficial the tree is. You can see that a 15-inch northern red oak, very common in our area, absorbs 3,821 gallons of storm water. It conserves 92 kilowatts of electricity if the tree is in a, in, a, in a place where there are houses or buildings that humans inhabit. It absorbs ozone, volatile organic compounds, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and particulate pollution. It reduces atmospheric CO2 by 700 pounds and it raises property values slightly. But if you wanna compare two trees on your property, you can do that too. You can get the data from one size tree and compare it to a different size tree. But remember I said, the larger the tree, the larger the benefit. With the well-publicized problems with pollinators like bees and butterflies, we are getting a hint of the vital importance of insects to the health of the environment. So the fifth amazing thing is this. Dr. Doug Tallamy, chair of the Department of Entomology and Wildlife and Ecology at the University of Delaware, has been researching this for many years. He has found that incredible numbers and varieties of insects live in trees specifically native trees. He published his research in a book called Bringing Nature Home. Home gardeners, by planting native species in general, and particularly native trees, 
can have a huge impact on the health of the environment. For optimum health, native, tree, native insects have developed to consume native species. And with alien invasive species like cattle repair, oriental bittersweet, and amber honeysuckle taking over the landscape, insects can't get enough of the food they need. The, gam the damage goes up the food chain from starving insects to starving birds and then to mammals. Oak trees are known to nurture over 500 kinds of Lepidoptera alone. So oak trees nurture 500 different varieties of moths and butterflies. The base of a healthy ecosystem is its insects and their survival depends on a large diversity of na native plants to nurture them. Dr. E. O. Wilson, Harvard Professor Emeritus and the founder of the study of ecology, calls in insects the little things that run the world. And just to remind you, turf grass is not a native and does not provide either habitat or food for insects. In our region, there's a slightly different group of plants that are, that are valuable to the pollinators, the insects in our area. In the Midwest, red maples, sugar maples, box elders, which are also maples, river birch, and pignut and shellbark hickory are the primary, woo, are the primary uh, uh, trees to nurture insects. Now that you've heard a little bit about trees, the wonderful, how wonderful trees are, we need to hear about what is happening to them because we are losing them at an ever increasing rate. The reason that the loss is dependent on geography, but in North America, we are losing trees primarily to alien invasive species. This graph, which I think comes from the, the uh, ISA website, measures canopy cover because talking about numbers of trees is misleading. For instance, when we cut down a large old tree and replace it with a sapling, we still have a tree there. And we might even have the same variety of tree, but they are not equal. As a matter of fact, it will take 200 years of growth to replace that large old tree with all of its many benefits. The older a tree gets, the more valuable its contribution to ecological health. On this slide, you can see that tree planting globally is just enough for the most part to, remake, to replace the trees taken down. We can see that Europe, North America, and Asia are basically balancing the trees taken down, which is on the left side of that zero, with the trees that they're putting in, which is the light green portion on the right side of the zero. More trees, on the other hand, we see South America is losing vast amounts of trees. More trees are lost in South America than are planted in North America. So we need to at least maintain our one for one ratio of trees taken down to trees planted. We should do better than that, but we aren't at this point in time. Once our neighborhoods generally looked like this, but insects from other continents have taken advantage of our transportation systems. Although it is not the first imported pest, the emerald ash borer has decimated the Midwest, primarily down the I-75 corridor from the Detroit area where these insects were introduced. Neighborhoods that looked like this 
began to look like this. And now they look like this. Where would you choose to live? The neighborhood on the left or the neighborhood on the right? This, by the way, is the same neighborhood before, during, and after the emerald ash borer arrived. Our Midwestern forests can have up to 40% ash trees, and if they aren't gone now, they will be soon. Looking out over Mount Airy Forest, you can see the dead branches above the canopy. These are the dead ash trees. They're letting them fall because there are too many of them to actually take down. There's only so much insectus. Oh, uh, I need to start better. Uh, emerald ash borer is susceptible to insecticide, but there is only so much insecticide that one can use before the sea ecosystem is totally compromised and human health begins to be affected because the insecticide that they use, in, it, it kills all insects, not just the EAB insect. And this is the little guy that's causing all the trouble. He's only about a half an inch long. He's very small, but he has eradicated all nine local species of ash tree. There is no ash resistance to this. And he's causing the loss of 10 to 40% of our region's trees. Another recent introduction is the Asian longhorn beetle. also known as the starry night beetle. This insect has the potential to be even more destructive than the emerald ash borer because it feeds on and kills almost all of our native hardwoods, not just ashes. An infestation was recently discovered east of Cincinnati. The only way we have of destroying this insect in an infestation is to take down every tree, every tree, within a five mile radius of where the insect was discovered. This is terribly destructive, but it's the only way to isolate and destroy these insects. I think Claremont County has uh, the, it has the uh, longhorn beetle, uh, I think it's been dead, designated that the beetle is gone, but they can come back at any time because we know they're around. The only beauty of these things is because they're about two inches long, they don't get very far. They don't fly fast and they don't travel. That's why a five mile radius traps them inside that radius and taking down the trees pretty much takes care of them. But there have been, there have been outbreaks in Chicago and in, I think in New Jersey, that have been contained as well. But we don't know where they're coming from, and we don't know where they're going to pop up next. And as far as in, 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 insect aliens invading, all of these lists come from somewhere else. They are not native to North America, and they all affect other oaks, pines, beech, viburnums, they all affect some of our native trees. Specifically down there on the bottom is the brown marmorated stink bug. I think you all have just seen these in the last few years. They've become very common and they try to get in your house in the fall because they, 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 uh, they hibernate in your house and then they leave in the spring. They are not just destructive to fruit trees, but they are also destructive to all agriculture. They eat all agricultural crops and they can, can, they do a lot of damage. Um, and they're also very quick. I think it was only a matter of a handful of years, maybe five years from when they appeared on the East Coast 
to when they were found in the crops in the California Central Valley. So they're fast and they're very, very destructive. So if you see one, don't just let it outside, kill it. Thank you. <laughs> These are all introduced species. And the news is even worse because it's not only insect species that are killing our trees, but also introduced species that are preventing our forests from regrowing. Amber honeysuckle, euonymus, and calorie pears are crowding our woodlands and preventing native seedlings from growing. And of course, there's Bambi, a native species so far out of control because of lack of natural predators. There may be as many as 100 times the number of deer in our landscapes today than there were in pre-European times. The only thing you can do is try to keep them from your trees. And in the forest, they nibble on all the, the, uh, the small trees trying to grow up from the seedlings. And so they, they not only kill mature trees, but they stop saplings from growing up. So people have been noticing all these problems. And our local regional planners, OKI, decided to found Taking Root in 2012. They began by recruiting lo local nursery owners, local tree boards, tree care companies, and arborists to discuss the problem and the potential solutions. In the eight years since its founding, they have had planted, they have caused to be planted, over 300,000 new trees. They have a school outreach program. They have had educational events and have sponsored tree plantings and given gr groups grants to support tree planting. And they maintain important par partnerships in the eight county area. The eight county o area, eight county OKI area, it's Hamilton, Butler, Warren, and Claremont counties in Ohio, Kenton, Campbell, and Boone counties in Kentucky, and Dearborn County in Indiana. The Make a Difference team, or the Trees Make a Difference team, the group that I work with, started in 2014. It's a good thing that our regional planners have developed and supported a concept like taking root. We need to take a top-down look at what is happening to our trees in our region, just as we need a bottom-up approach to encouraging individuals to plant trees. Some entities in our region do a good job of top-down evaluation of tree canopy cover. Great Parks of Hamilton County, Cincinnati Parks, and the organizations in Northern Kentucky do this surveying of their trees regularly. Great Parks of Hamilton County celebrated the planting of 100,000 trees between 2012 and 2016. That's 100,000 trees. And the Cincinnati, City of Cincinnati and Cincinnati Parks has a free tree program uh, that they initiated after the 2007 hurricane called Relief, where they give free trees to homeowners who will plant them around their houses. But many cities and neighborhoods are not so thoroughly overseen. Actually, some local, local governments still need to educate themselves about the value of trees versus for instance, the value of strip malls. Yes, that was irony. That's why everyone needs to be actively involved. Even now, trees are most, mostly just there, part of the scenery, but not something to be nurtured and val valued. In 2014, I attended a Taking Root meeting where the discussion was about ways to encourage community tree plantings. Rooster Rhodes, a board member of Taking Root, suggested National Make a Difference Day in October is a focus for tree planting efforts among individuals and neighborhoods. 
I volunteered immediately to participate in this effort. It sounded like something I could do. Our team is mostly older, but determined to actively participate, even though, for some of us, our whole digging days are way past us, behind us. In our first year as a team, that's odd. In our first year as a team, we trained volunteers at free workshops, attended Arbor Day and Earth Day celebration with our message about tree planting, and developed the relationships throughout the OKI area. The first year, volunteers we trained planted more than a thousand trees in their neighborhoods on a single day in October. For that work, we submitted that work to the National Make a Difference Day Foundation in Washington, D.C., and we won an award, one of 10 awards that was given that year, 10 awards for volunteer organizations in the nation. This was thrilling. We continue our efforts to put trees in the ground in October every year by offering individuals and communities information about tree planting, tool rental, and tool rental. And by the way, if any of you have um, a group who wants to hear about how to, how to create a tree planting, we will be happy to come and talk to you about it. And we also have a fall tree set sale of three gallon potted native trees and understory shrubs at wholesale prices. These are local trees. They're grown in Indiana, but for the most part, the seed comes from places in the Cincinnati area. For instance, Spring Grove is a huge donor of acorns for their, uh, their uh, oak trees. My hometown, Wyoming, participated in the first Make a Difference Day by planting trees along the newly restored banks of the Mill Creek. Other communities have de developed their own fall planting events. For example, Norwood, Madisonville, Woodlawn, and Fort Mitchell, Kentucky. And of course, I think somewhere it said Sydney, Ohio. The mayor of Sydney, Ohio called me to find out if he could get in on our, on our tree planting. And of course he couldn't because he, he, there was no way to, to share transportation. But we got him all set up and now he has his own fall planting in Sydney, Ohio. And I'm really tickled about that because we were, we are, um, we're having effect up and down I-75, I suppose. That, by the way, was uh, engineered by Wendy Van Buren, the local um, um, Department of Natural Resources forester for the Southwest District. We chose National Make a Difference Day in part because it's the largest day of volunteering in the U.S. And of course, fall is the best time to plant trees in our climate. And we continue to educate people on the best time, the best place, and the best species of trees to use. The best time is, of course, now or in the fall. The best places are in your yard, trees in the, in the um, tree lawn along the streets don't thrive as they can if they're in your lawn. And the best species to use is obviously the native species and native to, your, to our region. We try to pick trees that are native here, not native to Florida, for instance. We will have our 2020 tree order form on the Taking Root website soon if we can work out the logistics for a sale while social distancing. Sometimes that's a little difficult. The website is www.takingroot.info. That's how you get onto the, um, the Taking Root website. Um, let's see here. In 2019, our fifth anniversary, we added another outreach event to our calendar. 
In June, we had Spring Tree Day at Spring Grove Cemetery. This was a family-friendly day of things for kids to do while adults took tours of Spring Grove native trees by the horticultural staff. And we had information about taking root and trees make a difference team for anyone interested in planting trees. This year, we had hoped in June to have a speaker, Alan Seward of ODNR. He's actually a Northeastern forester, just like Wendy is Southwestern. We had planned on, well, he was planning on speaking about native trees and ways to improve home landscaping with natives. But we all know what happened this year. We're not discouraged though. Those plans are waiting for us to find a good time to have the event happen. Alan is more than willing to come down here and speak to us. So I guess what I'm telling you is you don't have to be a big institution or a massive task force to accomplish good things. Individuals can talk to their neighbors about adding a tree to the landscape. You can go to city council meetings and bring the value of trees to the attention of local government. Small groups can get donations from local businesses or the Taking Root organization to plant trees in neighborhoods and for neighbors who can't afford to or can't manage to plant trees. Talk up trees wherever you are and begin to notice how trees make our living space better for all of us. Thank you. Do you have any questions? <clears throat> no, yeah, this is Doug. I'm reviewing the uh, okay, Doug. window here to see what we have. Uh, uh, there's a uh, uh, Rich uh, put some information in there about uh, contacting Larry Householder. I don't see any questions in there. I have a couple of my own. Uh, in the okay. meantime, if anybody has uh, questions, would like to raise their hand, uh, we'll take your questions. Doug, it looks like we have a comment from uh, Nancy Ball saying great information, thank you. And from another Nancy Watrous, I apologize if I'm saying that wrong says, wonderful presentation. Please remind me the name of the presenter and contact info. So Gail, I'll, I'll let you say if you want a specific contact information shared with anyone. Well, um, yeah, you can write to me. I have a, a Taking Root um, email address and Taking Root um, email mailbox. So if you want to contact me, the address is M a D D as in make a difference day M A D D at taking root dot info. That's our that's our official address. Thanks, Gail. And I'll also type that in the chat for anybody who might have missed it. Thanks. I uh this is Doug. I want to uh, to uh, bring up one thing that you mentioned there, this concept of forest bathing. I uh, did run across that at, at uh, an earlier, uh, I think it was a first aid training. There was a woman who uh, was actually getting her certification in uh, forest bathing and uh, becoming a certified uh, leader of uh, such experiences. And I believe uh, has um, led some outings in the Cincinnati area. I don't know if it was done, I don't think it was done through our uh, meetup site, but I did see a uh, mention of it. It might have been Tri State Kayakers or something. Do you have any, uh, any further comment about the uh, forest bathing, uh, Gail? No, I don't really. I, I, I would be really curious to talk to this person and find out what her certification involves. But I think it would be a wonderful experience to do something like that. If there is training to be had, I'm really interested in finding out what it is. 
All right, I'll, uh, I'll dig back through my uh, notes and see if I can uh, come up with that name and, and some contact information. I think I was interested at the time, but it got lost in the yeah. lost along the way somewhere. I think the, the concept was sort of a guided meditation uh, through the forest. That would be, Which, uh, that would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah sounds, that would be really cool. Uh, sounds mighty appealing to me. Also, uh, I have a neighbor who, is, who told me uh, last year sometime that he had gotten a couple of free trees through this program. I wanted to uh, uh, mention that again. That, that really is a thing that's been going on for some time. I didn't know what it was called. I guess if you Google uh, Relief Cincinnati, R-E-L-E-A-F, yeah. Um, do, can you tell us any more about uh, how many trees and what time of year and, and well, it's uh, a, what? it's a I believe it's a fall event, but they have a lot of requests. So I would not wait until fall to get an application in. If you go to the you know city city of Cincinnati and 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 Google relief, I think there's some kind of a form you have to fill in and send it to the city. It is only for people who live in the city limits of the city of Cincinnati. Okay. So I think Nancy Ball had something she wanted to add to this conversation she was putting in the chat. Nancy, I have unmuted you. Thanks, Nicole. Yes, Doug, um, I know the person that you are speaking of um, that took the first day class with you. She's a very good friend of mine. Her name is Christina Willis. And she is certified in uh, forest therapy slash forest, uh, forest bathing. Um, she actually spent a, a great deal of time achieving that certification through a course that she traveled to North Carolina for and was pretty involved. Um, but it, I, I have participated in a couple of her walks and it's really pretty phenomenal. It's a great experience. If anybody is interested in following up with her, um, Gail, if you would like to get in touch with her, I would very happy. much. I'd be very yeah. happy to connect you. So uh, thank you. I, I have your email, so I can just uh, con connect you with Christina by email. Great, yeah. great. Give me that uh, info if you would as well, um, Nancy. I sure will, Doug. All right, thank you. Yes. Um, So Doug, we actually have gotten quite a few questions. So we actually have to scroll back a little bit. Let me know if you need some help. All right. Um, is the David Middleton one the first one? Oops. Oops. Uh, uh, David Middleton says, love this. I'll be in touch. Wendy. I don't know who Wendy is. Wendy, uh, probably uh, Wendy Van Buren. Oh, okay. That would that would be my guess. Uh, and the uh, Jean Swartle is asking: Are the blue ash trees killed by the vine borer? Uh, says question from Steve Rodenberg. Okay. Um, well, we don't know if there is an update on that, but um, we'll probably find out later in the future. So when he says vine borer, we're talking emerald ash borer. Is that what we're, is that what he's talking about? I, I don't know. I don't know. But all species of ash, blue ash, green ash, all species of ash are susceptible. Ah, when he says blue ash, he's talking about a particular type of ash tree. I see. He's not talking about that. The, would be my guess. Of, yes. Ah, uh, okay. Not this. Not the suburb. The tree. Yeah. Yeah. The emerald ash borer is pretty much done a number on all species of ash trees. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I lead hikes uh, in, in Alt Park uh, here in uh, Mount Lookout and uh, lots of uh, horizontal uh, ash trees to be seen there. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, Lauren, Lauren Enda says she'd like more information on uh, that as well. Laura, you talked is, are you talking about the emerald ash borer? I'll see if I can unmute you. Where'd she go? Uh, 
I'm trying to. No, I'm more interested in the forest therapy, if that's possible. Ah, okay. Now, uh, and uh, okay, my my, my um, I'm looking at multiple screens here at the moment. <laughs> I'm losing track of uh, who who was that again? Who asked the question? Lauren Enda. Lauren Enda, yeah. Um, Nancy, have you got contact information for her? Got to unmute Nancy now. Nancy, you should be unmuted now. Um, I, Lauren, if, I do not have your contact information, but if you want to just um, send it to me through the chat, you can send it to me privately through the chat. I'll be happy to connect you with Christina as well. Okay, uh, did I miss any earlier questions or comments, uh, Nicole? Yeah, we do have a couple. And just to let everybody know, I did give you all the capability to unmute yourselves, um, just so we don't have to go through and unmute people individually. But please be mindful when you're unmuting so you're not speaking above anybody else. Um, looking back to see um, which ones we might have missed, Jean Nightingale said, do you think trees communicate and is it better to plant trees in rows along the street or in a circle or grove so they can interact better? Uh -huh. Well, it depends on how long the, st the, the straight line is. If you can imagine trying to connect things that are in a circle, the closest that you, you don't have to stretch out the roots or the mycorrhizae as much if plants are in a group, in a circle, or in a some amorphous shape. If they're in a long line, that means the trees at the end of, in the beginning of the line are not as well connected. So yes, I would recommend planting things in a group. Of course, if you're talking about along the street, there's not hardly a way to plant them, except in a long, long line. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think that it's, it's wonderful that, that you say that it should be in a group, like holding hands, and so they, they could communicate. Well, that's exactly what they do, <laughs> amazingly enough. Yeah. Another uh, thing that struck me, uh, you, you said some trees don't nurture insects. Is that the native versus non-native? type thing or is it something else that uh, you know that determines which uh, nurture insects and which don't you have any idea on that well Doug what I said is some are better than others all native trees nurture insects even even alien invasive trees nurture insects it's just that the native ones are better for the insects that are natural in this area. So for instance, if you had a native tree right next to a native oak, right next to uh, uh, a ginkgo, for instance, ginkgos are not native to North America. The oak would have that 500 possibility of that 500 different species of Lepidoptera, but the, the, the ginkgo, would only have a handful, five or six or seven, hmm. in much smaller numbers. All trees nurture these things. It just depends on where they're native. Now, if a ginkgo in China, where it's, where it's native, probably nurtures as many insects as a native oak does here. It it's, depends on what is native and what is not. Right, so the native trees have had all those eons of time to to co-develop exactly. with uh, other species and, uh, you know, things that, uh, by, uh, DNA changes that uh, helped, uh, you know, those insects survived and the other ones didn't. And, and so the non-natives uh, have not had that prolonged period of, uh, uh, evolution <laughs> yes that's exactly uh, it 
That's exactly it. And if we want our native insects to, to, to be here and to be here for us to, you know, to, to, to feed the birds and to feed the, the uh, amphibians and, and, you know, all the way up the food chain, we have to have native trees. Yeah, it's, uh, I was, I've been thinking lately that uh, as a kid, I remember walking through a field, I would see, you know, grasshoppers by the scores, you know, flying up uh, as I walked along and, and see tons and tons of butterflies. And uh, there's, uh, uh, I don't experience that anymore. <laughs> no, no. And there's something really simple that you can do at this time of year which is to look out and see how many lightning bugs there are. Light, uh -huh. lightning, bugs, lightning bugs overwinter in tree litter. And between the insecticides and everybody scraping every single leaf off of their property, there's no place for lightning bugs to live anymore. Hmm. hmm. Yeah. That's true, Gail, because uh, I don't do that anymore. And my girlfriend came over for a visit one evening um, and she said, oh my goodness, you have so many lightning bugs out here. And it's because I don't use any pesticides. I leave my litter on the ground. Yep. And yeah, and, and I said, well, <laughs> you have a ground crew that comes in and, you know, sweeps out all your garbage and makes sure your lawn looks pretty and stuff like that. That's right. So, yeah. That's right. I was just going to mention on the relief program, that's something that I've used quite a bit myself. This is Karen. Um, the relief program, um, I hope they have it this fall, but you can get up to two trees um, for your own yard. Um, it might be down to one, but it is, it does have to be about 30 feet or visible from the street. Um, so it is more about the front yard that they're trying to reforest. Um, and I encourage people very much to try to even encourage your neighbors and people that are moving into your neighborhood to start adding back the um, trees in the front of their house because there are very safe trees to put in there. They were put in way too close to the houses years ago and so a lot of them have been taken down and we yeah. have a lot of beautifully forested neighborhoods that are getting lost um, and streets are becoming much more barren. And if we put trees, you can put them a little bit closer to the sidewalk and usually that way it's far enough away from the house but you still want to you know have the advantage of the shade either for your house or the sidewalk so that when people walk up and down the street you know they can be outside and enjoy it one thing that um makes me mad <laughs> that i've seen that i see quite a bit is when people let vines uh grow up their trees and uh, over time, they completely take over the tree and, and kill it. And uh, I'm not an expert at that. I would assume that uh, any kind of crawling vine like that, creeping vine, is, is bad. Does anybody know for sure if there's any that are not bad? And uh, Gail, do you want to answer that? Or I can't. Uh, yeah, if you don't. I think okay. everything, everything that grows up a tree, the, the, um, the the grapevines that grow up, I, uh, ivy can grow up and be a terrible pest. Um, I think anything that grows up, it may not kill the tree, but it gets very heavy and it'll bring down branches and things like that. And um, and if it's big enough, like wisteria growing up a tree, that has a, a pretty substantial um, stem and, and uh, wisteria can actually strangle a tree. So if it's hmm. a vine, it's probably not a good thing to grow up a tree. Yeah, so that's a thing we can all um, be aware of in our neighborhoods. If uh, if we see uh, that happening in in our neighborhoods, uh, let people know that's that's not a good thing, and uh, they ought to do something about that. Yeah. Uh, it's hey, not Doug, that hard to yeah. kill them. <laughs> Doug, it's actually pretty easy to take care of. Um, right. <laughs> you, can, you can go into your tree and you can cut about a foot section from the bottom to where, it, you know, where it's going up the tree. And if you cut a, that foot, foot and a half section of your vine and leave it, the top part, most of it will die. Yeah. Um, and so it's not like people think, oh my gosh, how am I going to get all this out of my tree? 
Um, yeah. If they can just do the bottom section, it's amazing how much you can really yeah. kill in a quick, quick amount of time. Yeah, and then the, yeah. The, the rest of the vine comes out of the tree when the tree sheds its bark. Yeah. So it just grows out of it. Oh, good. Yeah. What the we, bitter, uh, bittersweet, we bittersweet is a really beautiful vine, but it does kill the tree. And yes. uh, you have to choose, I guess. All right. Yeah. Well, bitter, bittersweet is actually not, it's, it's an invasive um, plant. Okay. <laughs> I'll kill it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, when Sorry, we do yes. uh, trail maintenance out in the Little Miami Trail, we do a lot of cutting of vines of various sorts. Uh, watch out for some of the ones that might be uh, poison ivy or poison oak. <laughs> Use some gloves if you're going to do it. But um, mostly it's, uh, like you say, these are grapevine type things that are really uh, uh, in, in many areas have taken over. But don't and, uh, kill the Virginia that creeper, out. you guys. Don't What's kill that? the Vir Virginia creeper. Gail, is that true? Yeah. Yeah. The, you, uh, well, Virginia creeper can get big and heavy too. Okay. I mean, it's it, 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 it's um, it's native and it's not harmful, except when it gets a heavy load on a branch and the branch breaks down. Okay. Virginia creeper, you know, is it's okay, you know, on a brick house or something like that because it it, it has the has the ability to withstand the weight. But yeah, I, I have very mixed feelings about Virginia creeper, but, but something that, um, that has become a real pest just in the past couple of years is something called porcelain berry vine. Oh yeah. <laughs> and it has, it's, it's still being sold in the nurseries. It is a beautiful leaf, a beautiful plant, and it gets these beautiful berries on it, but Holy mackerel! Does that stuff grow fast and it spreads like crazy? It's 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 really bad, and it is it is a, it not a native. It is not something you want in in the yard. Hmm. Okay. Basically, you really don't want much of anything growing up your tree. Nope. All right. Hey, um, Doug. I'm seeing a question about mosquitoes in here, and I know that's something. Um, Gail, do you know much about that? Because that's something I've kind of um, well, you mean been like the, at. the people who come and, and spray for mosquitoes, like that mosquito busters or whatever they're called? Is that what the question's about? Well, there's the, no. It says we have a weird amount of mosquitoes. Mosquitoes have been increasing in everybody's yard, and have become a problem. I have a friend who actually thinks she read somewhere that mosquitoes in the daytime are in the trees. I can't imagine that's true. It's probably some, you know, false information that somebody yeah, I don't, plastered somewhere. I but, don't think so. Yeah. I mean, but, I, they're, uh, yeah. they're everywhere. Mosquitoes, yeah. they light everywhere, whether it's in the, you know, on the, the, the stuff that's on the, the plants that are on the ground. They're, they're herbaceous plants. They're on woody plants. Their mosquitoes are everywhere. But, yeah, don't get me started on those mosquito killer companies. This is Nancy Ball. I, I, had, I had a question about the mosquitoes. Actually, um, so I've been, <laughs> we moved to a new neighborhood last year and the mosquitoes here are, are just thick and it's, it's, it's astonishing to me because we're not that close to any sources of water. And we actually moved from a five acre wooded lot that backed up to, I don't know, probably a hundred other acres of woods that was very close to multiple creeks and uh, there was a, a small creek that ran right through our front yard that always had a, a pool of still water and the mosquitoes there are just a tiny fraction of what we have here in our new home where we're in the middle of all these manicured lawns with um, you know we don't we've we've the, the back field is full of honeysuckle so we're losing all of our native plants and um, I you know I've been trying to figure it out and talking to some of my friends um, Actually, one of my friends owns a nursery and she does all totally chemical free everything and talking with her about it. And um, it seems that the, this imbalance between losing our native plants and using insecticides on the yards all around us, which of course is having an impact on the insect population, which then is having an impact on the bird population, but it's not impacting the mosquitoes. So they're just going to town. And, yeah. um, and and so then, then the uh, then the neighbors well. want to go spray more more no, chemicals. You don't want to, yeah, you don't want to spray, Nancy. <laughs> no, I, mean, I agree. Put yeah. up put up a bathhouse. 
yeah, like yeah. bats to come into your neighborhood. Oh, we're They're planting uh, native trees in our yard. We've got bird feeders up. The bat house is on the list. We haven't gotten that done yet. And we're also just trying to advocate to all of our neighbors that, you know, it's also a fire out of balance. It's not going to get better and continuing to spread chemicals. It's not going to, not going to improve this. What's yeah. happening to the bats? The bats are, are disappearing. I, I have a bat house and I've got, I've lost my colony. Well, there is a disease, a smutty nose disease that's going around and, and affecting bats that hibernate in caves over the winter. And smutty nose is, is, is really fatal to the bats. So, you know, keep it out there and hopefully you'll get some bats. But, but bats are having a hard time too. Hey, um, uh, Doug, Rich Jordan is asking a really interesting question that I'm seeing on the, on the chat that you might want to check. Yeah, I was uh, just about to, un uh, I'm trying to unmute him. I thought I had unmuted him. Uh, he should be able to unmute himself since he's a co-host. Oh, co-host. <laughs> yeah, if you want to ask your own question, Rich, go ahead. Oh, ah, okay. Well, Gail, this is a pretty good presentation. I always enjoy this for some reason. Oh, thanks, Rich. I, I, went, I went to the, ta uh, the Taking Root uh, uh, event in Claremont County uh, last year. It was it was a very good event. It's, oh. uh, it was unfortunate it was canceled. Uh, so, uh <laughs> I had basically had two questions. Um, so uh, we're losing our native trees. I, I'm just wondering uh, when uh, the arborists are going out and, and replanting, what, what types of trees are, are, uh, are they using as replacements? Uh, are, you know, are there some hardy species? Uh, for this climate? Sure. For there's, this part of the country, yeah. Yeah, there's wonderful. I mean, almost any kind of oak, white oak, red oak, northern, um, Chickapin oaks, there's all kinds of oaks, there's all kinds of maples. Do you mm -hmm. remember the, the slide I had? Um, let me back up. Oh, something's all over my screen. If you go, if you go to the Cincinnati Zoo site, Rich, yeah. um, they also <laughs> have a list of, um, of trees. They have some pretty good lists of trees yeah. and things like that, too. There yeah. we go. Oaks, willows, cherries, plums, birches, poplars, and cottonwoods. And then for our area... Red maple, sugar maple, box elder, river birch, and shellbark and pignut hickories. So okay. those are all good. All right. So then my other my other question was, um, um, uh, we've got a few red buds in the neighborhood, and uh, I've got a I've got a uh, like a swale that runs behind my house, but I've got quite a few uh, uh, saplings popping up in that swale area. I just I'm just wondering about red buds, good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> Give them away. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're, they're mean, wonderful. They're, they're wonderful, but every single seed that a red bud produces seems to, to, to actually germinate and create a new yeah. red bud. I mean, they really do take over. Interesting. Okay. Well, uh, I, I'm hoping they, re they replace the honeysuckle that, that I've been battling. Oh, well, yeah. If you've replaced honeysuckle, let them go. They're far yeah. better than honeysuckle. Yeah. All right, cool. All right. I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, this is Lauren. I have a quick question. So uh, kind of on the tail of that, uh, so when like the Dutch um, elm disease and the, all the ash problems that you were talking about, so are those trees lost forever? Can they not be replaced or replanted later? I mean, have we just given up on those trees in this area? Is, is that um, the end? I think there are people at universities who are doing research to try to develop a, a borer resistant ash just like they have just come up now with um, chestnut blight resistant chestnuts mm -hmm. and elm disease resistant elms so the trees that are here with the dna that they have are all susceptible to the disease that took them out it doesn't matter whether they are, they're going to be seeds or, or rootstock that is going to sprout again. Those, those insects and that disease will come back and wipe it out because it can, because of the DNA. The universities are trying to tweak that ever so little to make <laughs> it resistant. The, um, let's see, what are they called? The Patriot Elms. There's there's yeah. patriot elms and there's there's different kinds of elms that are elm dis, elm elm uh, disease resistant. Same things going on with the chestnuts. 
there just aren't, I mean, this is, how long has we, have we missed the chestnuts? It's all, it's probably been a hundred years since the chestnut blight came through here. And we're just coming uh -huh. up with a resistant strain. So it'll take a while before anybody comes up with resistant strains of ash. I, I uh, this is Doug. I thought in, uh, that I heard in, in, with the emerald ash borer in, in particular, uh, once they've come through and, and done their damage and moved on elsewhere, it, uh, I think it is, I thought I heard that it is possible to have ash trees start coming back again. Well, if the ash trees come back, the, the uh, emerald ash borer will come back. Oh, okay. It's sort of like coronavirus. They don't really know because they haven't been through enough episodes to learn. That's right. What's really going to happen. It's totally unknown. This is a very, the emerald ash borer is a very recent phenomenon. I don't remember, Karen, do you? Was it, was it introduced in like 1992 or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it's very recent. And uh, so they don't have enough history on it. Um, they can only, I, they do know that they come in like episodes and they'll last for a while. Like we just, I don't know whether we're at the end of or in the middle of the eastern side of town, um, Emerald Ashbor. Um, and it used to be on the, was it the west side, Gale, before that, several yeah. years ago? Yeah. And now it's yeah, on the yeah. east side and then it'll, move, you know, it'll be gone. It'll slow down here for a while and then go somewhere else. That's the only thing they know. It's just real. The only thing they can do is come up with resistant varieties. The yeah. resistant varieties are the best way to um, overcome anything. And that's why, I don't know whether you guys were at the talk that I did about two months ago, but that's where the cultivars and the nativars are really, really important because they often are grown for their resistance. And we don't have, um, you know, they're not, they're, they still have the same benefits that the regular native species have, um, but they also have a resistance to some of the diseases and stuff like that that go on in the pests. Yeah, I, I've been uh, spending quite a bit of money to inoculate my an, a huge ash tree that's leaning over my house, and it's been quite successful, but I dare not stop the inoculation, and it's costing me a lot of money. I'm hoping that maybe I can weather the storm and maybe eventually those things will disappear and I, it will survive without inoculation. What do you think? I think the chances of that are small, but if you really love your tree, you're gonna to have to pay for it, unfortunately. Uh, it, it, I love my tree because otherwise it's gonna kill me. If it <laughs> I know, there are a lot of people in that position. There really are. Okay. You're uh, getting some very nice uh, additional compliments in the chat window area from uh, Nancy Watrous and uh, Ruth Hardy and uh, some others. Uh, uh, I would like to end the formal part of the program here soon and stop the recording, but 